Today, we continue our look at the life and times of the solid man William Muldoon as he continues to defend his title, helps a champion boxer get back in shape for one more run, and becomes a celebrity trainer to the stars. Crazy territory stories, double crosses, and swerves. Pro wrestling history nerds. Oh my lord, we are all back here again recording a podcast talking about the history of pro wrestling. The history of pro wrestling, everybody. I'm excited. My name's Nick Gossard, and may I introduce my partner, the Dorcas to my Malorcus. It's Chongo Bronson. Yes, hello, old chap, and this is the take two on Mel Dew. All right. And what we are doing here, we're, you know, this is a pro wrestling history podcast. If you're looking for our hot takes on Monday Night Raw, wrong fucking place. You want to know what we thought about AEW? No idea. Didn't watch it. We're just diving headfirst into the deep, deep waters that is the history of pro wrestling. And if you missed part one, our very first episode, we have been talking about the solid man, William Muldoon, childhood civil war hero. Well, not a hero, he was a drummer boy, but he was there, that's heroic enough. Uh, Fought in the Prussian, uh, Franco-Prussian war, Um, Greco-Roman champion, traveled the world, bodybuilder, amazing specimen, amazing human being, one of the biggest stars in wrestling in the late 1800s. And that brings us to now. Yeah, I mean, Greco-Roman champion, Broadway play, international superstar, war maker in three wars, at the age of 12 was in combat with a drum in his hand and kept beat. The take two on Maldu, I mean, uh, and then he was a Greco, I mean, he was dominant, man, and he was just a flamboyant umbrella of greatness. Yeah, he was one, really one of the first people to combine athleticism with showmanship. You know, this is a guy who could beat your ass. And this is back when wrestling was a legitimate sport. You know, it wasn't always legitimate, but no sports were. Everything had a, had a shady side, particularly in combat sports, because those are the easiest ones to throw. However, he was maybe the toughest son of a bitch on two legs at this point in history. But he also would tour with carnival shows and he would dress up as a gladiator for photo shoots and he was in Shakespeare plays with a member of the Barrymore acting family. I mean, he was he, he, he was a media sensation and for good reason. Yeah, and, and in, in part one, I mean, there were at least four Mel Gibson movies derived from, from the stories of this man's life and, and then not to mention like, uh, I mean, he went and he joined the Foreign Legion like he was foreign in the foreign legion man he was american and went to france to go fight just to fight and learn how to to wrestle that's commitment to the art brother yeah i I, that's the thing we talked about last week or last uh, time that it was a different time people had to be tougher and the world was a bigger crazier adventure than it is now we're talking about a man who took part in the Civil War and went, I need more war, and went to France, fought against Germany, came back, was a cop, was a wrestler, fought his way to be the world champion, defended it several times over. But as we were starting to see, he kind of hit a peak, as all fighters do. He started having trouble uh, winning matches. He started putting out crazy stipulations. And at 34 years of age in 1886, he kind of knew his years as champion material were coming to a close. He continued his uh, training. He continued his exhibition matches with the theaters and the vaudeville and the carnivals and soon landed the role that would put his training system on the map for good by training John L. Sullivan for a title defense. And if you don't know who John L. Sullivan was, he was the greatest boxer of his day. He was the most dominant bare knuckle yeah. boxing champion of the late 1800s. And this isn't, you know, like boxing today where you'd be go five, three minute rounds. No, these rounds were sometimes, these fights were sometimes a hundred rounds long. Yeah, 100 rounds. Bare knuckle, drinking whiskey in the corner like goddamn animals. Things were a lot crazier in sports back then, just like things were crazier in life back then. But this was a huge moment for everyone involved, and we'll get to that here in a little bit. But before he was able to train Sullivan, he had plenty going on in his own life. He was uh, finishing a tour with the, with the theater. A much-anticipated match against uh, Evan Strangler Lewis fell through, unfortunately. Uh, but he took part in another five throws in an hour match against Masuda, his old weird foil. And he couldn't repeat it throw his Japanese adversary and conceded the win to Matsuda, which is starting to be a trend in his career, where he creates these big stipulations of throwing them multiple times in an hour and can't quite pull it off. 
Meanwhile, a year ago, he would have, or a couple years ago, he would have steamrolled everybody. Whether that's age, whether that's wear and tear, because everything you hear us talking about with these matches, these are not good. Like hour long wrestling matches are not good for your body. Uh, shocking news to everyone, doctors included. But there's also a little thing, and you know, I know you know the 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 psychological uh, feeling of this. We see this with champions in every sport, especially individual sports, specifically in fighting sports, where if a champion is champion too long you kind of start seeing in their eyes that they're looking for an out. Yeah. You see them kind of having that, you know, you're top of the world, too much press, too much time, too much training. There's that self-destruct button built into all of our brains where if things go too well, too long, you kind of start poking at it a little bit. Yeah, it is. It is the proverbial lightning bolt, riding the lightning bolt. And to, to stay on the day-to-day moment-to-moment duties of being the champ and to being that person, it, it is it is a self-destructive wild ride, man. And it takes a lot to stay on that bad boy for very long. And nobody stays on for that long. But I I I had the realization between between you know part one and part two here that it was brilliant what he did because here's here's what he did from a working perspective. Without even having working adversaries, he protected his true legacy because yes, did he not win the match? He didn't win the match, but what was the match? I had to beat him five times. So even though he he was not, he he realized in his decline in skills by by hiding and masking with these stipulations, he could potentially lose and lose some face, but still be able to say, he didn't beat me. I just didn't beat him five times. And I think that's very clever and carny on his part. Oh, exactly. And but it also puts him in a bad spot because at a high level, it's easier to play defense than it is to win with offense. Where like he had a match with uh, Evan Lewis where they had the multiple throw stipulation and Lewis's manager said, you know, you don't have to throw it. Don't worry about throwing him. Just worry about him not throwing you. Yeah, totally. And, you know, like I said, it's a, there is a psychological component of being on top for too long. We saw that a lot, uh, you know, about 10 years ago when UFC champs used to hang on to their titles for like five, six years when you had the G- George St. Pierre's, the Anderson Silva's, the Ronda Rousey's. And you start seeing them kind of getting weird, kind of getting lazy. And it's just, you know, that much pre- – that's a lot of pressure. You know, being the top guy, top gal – Huge amount of pressure, and it's not always a fun place to be. So sometimes you start looking for a way out. And he also clearly had backup careers on top of backup careers. But he, you know, here's the thing. He still had the title. One, one component of that that I have come across in my experience with being around top guys, guys like Rampage, guys like Mighty Mouse Johnson, when you've, you know, Mighty Mouse cleaned out his entire division and was starting to have rematches with guys he'd already beat on that title run. When you are that much better than everyone else, it is hard to drum up motivation to keep yourself at your sharpest because your sharpest isn't required to get the job done. It's an easy thing to fall victim to that we see many of the greats fall victim to. And I think I think maybe he he fell victim to it as well. I believe so, because, you know, you started seeing the decline, you know, when he finally did uh, tie up, you know, have a match with Evan Strangler Lewis. Lewis was a much stronger, smaller guy. Lewis, you know, Strangler Lewis was a catch as catch can style wrestler. Brutal submission game. He injured a lot of people. He was a real, uh, real piece of work, as the kids would say. Uh, he was a mean guy. Uh, we'll, we're probably going to talk about him in the next couple of episodes because I, I find him fascinating. But he was just too mean to be cooperative with worked matches. Um, he was a dangerous submission expert and. If he ever felt disrespected, had no problems hurting people, um, Muldoon's off-foil uh, Sorokichi, he hurt him twice, uh, choked him unconscious, and the referee didn't know it, so he was like being choked unconscious for 30 seconds. Think that's uh, good for the brain? Oh, yes. It's it's perfect remedy for, for having any kind of future of remembering your life, you know? It is, he's the definition of a shooter. Strangler Lewis was a guy who understood aspects of submission grappling in certain areas at a very high level and at that time no one when the 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 knowledge was so so scarce that one hold could literally you know turn a man into a killer anywhere he went and unfortunately he had that knowledge and was also a mean son of a bitch because in the second match with uh sorokichi he wrecked his leg with a what we would call a knee bar now um didn't 
hair or anything, but he apparently couldn't walk for weeks. And uh, as a person who enjoys walking, I can sympathize with how bad that, that would be. That is a total dick move. I mean, especially in the pantheon of submission maneuvers to do to somebody, that's like an extra, that speaks to his, like how much of a jerk this guy really was. hundred percent. And although Lewis's expert was that catch as catch can style, he faced Muldoon under Greco-Roman rules. Muldoon showed up overweight, uh, whether that was him being injured or just being spending too much time on Broadway, not being as motivated as he had in the past, he didn't look great. But Lewis also had recently recovered from an illness. He had a bout with a Russian flu, which is not a euphemism for a vodka hangover, uh, if anybody's wondering. That's how I use it, but it was a legitimate illness. So they were both in bad shape. Muldoon still wanted to put one of his goofy stipulations that he had to throw Lewis in 15 minutes or Lewis would be declared the winner by default. And um, he almost did it. Muldoon did catch him with a waist lock and throw the strangler, but he turned over, landed on his knees and hands, but popped his face right on the uh, hard floor. And like we discussed in the previous episode, this isn't a ring, this isn't on a wrestling mat. This is hardwood floor, maybe with some carpet on it. So it fucked his face up. Yeah. Lewis was pissed, popped up, managed to catch L Muldoon with a headlock takeover and you know tossed him. Uh, Muldoon landed on his hands and knees as well. Both men were exhausted by the end of the 15 minute mark. Muldoon called it a match told the crowd that he couldn't throw Lewis and that he was the toughest man he'd ever faced. How the ghost of Clarence Whistler felt about that, well, we will not know without a Ouija board or a visit to hell. Yeah, that was another another declaration from another territory back when he could say the same, one, that about one man in every area pretty much and it'd never be found out. But I think a couple things are interesting there. One, that he called that it was gonna be a 15 minute time. Like he knew how long he, he could go or he was willing to go, so he, he, you can see that he's always been very perceptive of kind of self-aware with his with his career too. I think after slamming you know a strangler on his face and get you know if you've ever been in any kind of competition uh, combative sport, you know once you get hit or you get taken down, it just fires you up to come back even harder the next time. So I think when he, the fact that he got a headlock takeover on a Greco expert, that's the first time that in all we've talked about that there's been a, a definitive head take over that degree on, on him. And I think maybe he got a hold of his, his artery with his knowledge of guillotines and headlocks and then maybe got him to get over. I mean, that's just my, you know, I guess I'm doing like what CSI <laughs> kind of like post-op. Do, doing some forensics on the, on the blood splatter. But no, I mean, we're both doing the same thing, thinking about like, how did that look? Cause I mean, obviously yeah. there's no footage from the late 1800s um, because both, both wrestlers were experts in their own set of rules. Muldoon had nothing but good things to say about uh, Ev about Evan Lewis. Evan Lewis, on the other hand, bastard that he was, said he couldn't throw me, but I'm pretty sure I could have thrown him. Yeah. Not good guys. And Muldoon went on to have a series of unspectacular matches against local wrestlers while uh, traveling. If there were works, it doesn't really matter. It nobody like these were not matches that made the papers in any big important way. They're kind of lost to history, except for a blurb in the Cincinnati Sun. He was more interested in theater, more interested in tra in his training school, and everybody kind of knew he was on his way out as a competitor. However, he did manage to land the biggest break of his career as a personal trainer when John L. Sullivan was ready to begin his training camp. Um, it was 1889. Uh, leading up to this, the Police Gazette, it was a sleazy gossip paper in New York City, and the publisher, Richard Fox, hated, hated Sullivan. He hated John L. Sullivan over a public insult at a fancy restaurant. And after that, Fox wanted to ruin Sullivan. He would publish slanderous articles about him. If you can really slander a guy whose primary hobbies are smoking, drinking, and uh, chasing women, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, and he would also back the toughest fighters he could to, tr and would like declare them to be the real champ, but each one would fall victim to Sullivan in the ring. But Sullivan was just getting more and more out of shape, spending more and more time in bars. And Richard Fox found an amazing boxer in Jack Kilrain. Uh, Sullivan had been touring Britain and partying so hard that his backers were almost ready to forfeit his 10K side bet, then let uh, Sullivan get into the ring and take a beating. So they, the you know, so Sullivan promised to stay sober. That promise lasted about two weeks. So they got hold of William Muldoon and said, will you please, please turn his life around? An agreement was reached because despite the money that I'm sure he got, knew that this was going to be PR gold 
for what he was trying to sell with his uh, his fitness system. So they sent Sullivan up to his farm in New York, uh, which was 20 miles away from the nearest um, nearest bar. Not a lot of opportunities to get drunk. And the training began. Uh, Muldoon forced Sullivan to stop drinking, smoking, made him eat right and train properly. And Sullivan hated every second of it. Uh, he was not a, he was not not a motivated young go getter. He was in his 30s, and he just wanted to uh, you know he wanted to be a winner. He didn't want to do the winning. Yeah, this is like grumpy old men, Rocky Four. I mean, this is this is so unbelievably the definition of just like macho, just alpha male insanity. To to understand the archetypes of who these guys are, this is the 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 Greco world champion who held the title for almost better part of a decade while going on to be an entertainer and to cross all these different you know, avenues and, and take so many different directions while holding on to the belt. And then you have like the meanest, toughest, like, you know, your archetypal bare knuckle boxer with the mustache, the, the snidely whiplash. I mean, it was, when you think of the boxers of that era, that, you know, Sullivan is the guy that all those sort of mental projections are based on. Exactly, if, you're, if you look into your brain and picture old timey boxer, you're picturing John Sullivan. Yeah. And speaking of the mustaches, Look up the names of everybody I've mentioned uh, over the course of this, and you will see, you'll be like, put them all together. Is it a barbershop quartet? Is it a hipster bar? Or is it the toughest sons of bitches of the late 1800s? You be the judge. But yeah, so they got him up to, uh, uh, you know, they knew that he was out of shape. They knew he was an alcoholic. Uh, Sullivan was sent up to this training camp where the daily routine would be up at 7 a.m., go on a one mile walk, followed by breakfast of oatmeal, cracked wheat, and eggs, because Sports nutrition is a very recent science. Uh, it's, you know, they didn't really have a good handle on it. They were doing the best they had with the ingredients they had because you couldn't just go to Whole Foods, buy Brussels sprouts and, uh, you know, whole, you know, whole grain, whatever. It's like, no, it's like, oh, what are we eating today? It's like, well, the farm over there grew corn. I have wheat and I'm pretty sure we can catch a, a fish in that river. Yeah. And they, but, you know, and given those constraints, it's actually a remarkable uh, job of, of approximating a, a healthy athletic diet. I mean, these are, this is a huge guy and it, and it's, it strikes me as hilarious because half of the job in a situation like this is you got to be a beast enough to physically wrangle one of the baddest men in the world. You know, Sullivan, he's not going to take a no for an answer that he doesn't want to take. So you're going to have to make him, if he really decides he wants to go after the booze or he, he's not with the training, you know, we we're talking about such a, a odd couple. The the magnitude of this, the, the greatest wrestler and the greatest boxer of this era in this sort of like mashup and you know it's almost like a buddy cop. I don't even know, man. It, no, it's it, it, so it is. It's, it's like a weird training montage. Yeah. You expect like some you know like just just like a smash cut of all these training scenes set to you know like a Stan Bush song. But yeah, it's like he ran things as a boot camp because he knew he had to cycle a lot. Whether you were a pro athlete with years of experience or if you were an out of shape businessman, you had to have a shock, a psychological shock to the system because you had to have your habits broken, you had to have your ego broken down yeah. so you can stop doing the thing, your bad habits. And that was just the morning that I just described. You know, after they would uh, digest, he would hit the heavy bag and spar because, you know, they didn't know about CTE back then. He would learn, he learned how to wrestle better because I didn't know this. I don't know if anybody uh, listening knew this. I think it's cool. Under the uh, London prize ring rules, um, a th you know, throws were allowed in boxing. You could throw a guy and it was the same as a knockdown from a punch. So they were really hell bent on turning him into a better wrestler. And Sullivan told the press that if he had trained wrestling earlier in his career, he would have uh, actually finished Charlie Mitchell, who he called the world's greatest sprinter in the ring. Yeah, well, that that hurts, you know, uh, that kind of he to be able to understand the level of perfection of nuance of grappling style that Greco fits into the boxer's ability to do takedowns and to do dirty boxing. It is the perfect grappling, grappling complementary style to boxing with this rule format. And because of that little nuance, that made for a perfect combination for 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 Maldu to be the right guy to train Sullivan. Exactly. And if you ever want to know like how Greco-Roman and boxing combined, 
watch old Randy Couture matches. He was a Greco-Roman uh, specialist, learned how to do that dirty boxing, use the Greco-Roman to control you, and then when you're trying to fight his control, boom, hooks and uh, uppercuts, hooks and uppercuts, and they do not feel very nice. So yeah, it's, it's a fantastic combination of skills that worked well within the rules they were fighting under. And then after, you know, maybe after lunch, they would go on a 12 mile walk through the woods. Once he lost some weight, it would be jogging, chop down some trees, just farm boy CrossFit, yes. if you will. Yes. Um, Sullivan came to training camp weighing 260. He'd been around just a little over 200 when he won the title initially. Muldoon wanted him down to 220 by fight day. And the press was just covering this. This was big news because yeah. You know, you always say like, how on earth was this big news? Why was the whole world following this? Well, this is before the internet. This is before movies. This is before most sports. This was big news and the world treated it accordingly. So come day of fight, you know, they head down to Louisiana where the fight was scheduled to happen. But here's the problem. Boxing was illegal in Louisiana at the time. Small problem. Uh, the new the new sheriff wouldn't take the uh, the normal bribe, so they did what anybody would do. Oh, do you think they quit? No, they brought in a train, loaded up the 3,000 audience members, the fighters, the cornermen, the equipment, and the ring, took it over state lines to Mississippi, where that's town sheriff didn't want the fight to happen. But being a more pragmatic person, he took the $200 bribe from the promoter and he left happy. <laughs> so they, they, they crossed the state lines to, to, get, to get away from running one illegal show and still took the audience over and ran an illegal show, but got away with it with the bribe. It's the way to do it. But hey. Yeah. Uh, the, it's called working, man. <laughs> yeah, the, the set up the ring. Wow. Fighters loose, got warmed up. The crowd got uh, ready for it. Beautiful. And the fight lasted 75 rounds, which is over two hours of boxing. Uh, before Kilrain was such a bloody mess that his corner threw in the towel. And if you're picturing two boxers, exhausted, pouring yeah. blood, drinking I mean, whiskey in the corner between rounds, you are 100% right because that is what it was. Yeah, and that's the missing ingredient in going deep in rounds today. Everyone knows whiskey is the key to going deep. You know, when you're talking 25 rounds plus, back in the day, they would go 75 to 100 to 125 rounds. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's completely bananas. Um, and, you know, it was a huge affair, big moment for everyone involved. And the upside was the massive press and publicity that Muldoon received for his training facility. Uh, the downside was the warrant for his arrest. Since prize fighting was illegal in most states, including Mississippi and Louisiana, um, so he spent most of 1888 dealing with the legal difficulties from this fight. His wrestling matches were mostly just exhibitions on theater shows. Uh, in, no in November of that year, he was injured. He wrestled uh, Cornish wrestler Jack Karkeek, and Muldoon did one of his goofy stipulations, saying that he would give Karkeek $2 for every minute he would last against him. Muldeen couldn't throw Karkeek, and during the match, uh, he got Karkeek in a back body lock. Muldoon, uh, he was pushing Muldoon's hand down to break the hole, twisted it, and broke two fingers. Ah, the small yeah. joint manipulation is dirty pool, I say. Yeah, it is not a. It is. It is. It is a. It's. It works. You know, you yes, don't get dragged on form. You know, yeah. not something you get dragged on Twitter for back in those days. But it is a, a dirty move. But goddamn, if it doesn't work. Yes. Um, he healed up. He had an unspectacular 15-minute draw against uh, Evan Lewis in December. Uh, Lewis, pissed off at just how bad the match was, challenged him to a three out of five series, but Muldoon refused. He was on his way out of the sport, and he knew it. Yeah, and that's that's the young, hungry lion looking to, you know, push push the old the old king as far as he can push him, you know, until he, he breaks. He realizes that the fed lion doesn't want to hunt anymore, you know, that it, that's a – a pitfall of all great champions from Mike Tyson to, you, you know, you name them, that, that is the downfall of greatness. And, you know, it's, and it's easy to get like, be like, Oh, that's bullshit. He should take on all comers. You can kind of understand just like knowing you're on your way out and not wanting to put your body at risk against somebody like Evan Lewis, who was well known for injuring people by holding on to submissions too long. And plus these are the days when referees didn't know the submissions. So they'd be like, Oh wow, he's bending his arm pretty far. Yeah. It's snap, crackle, and or pop. Um, so this, so in 19, I'm sorry, in 1890, uh, him and Lewis met once more. Uh, single fall match. Muldoon used a hammerlock to turn Lewis onto his back for the win. And the 38-year-old decided that after a decade of being the champion, 
that was his last match. He would retire in, you know, at the end of the year. He was also still busy with his legal problems. The state of Mississippi was still trying to charge everybody involved in the Kilrain Sullivan fight. The NYPD arrested their former detective for and had to extradite him back to Mississippi because wait, a judge. Wait, so so to, what do you think that was like? That conversation when they, that, that warrant came through the wire, however they were communicated about that. But you know, these are his former workmates, right? He worked with these guys. Who do you think, what do you think? Yeah, he was, yeah he was the police champion before he was the world champion. He was their enforcer. And they had to come up and show, hey, uh, William, uh, hey, gotta, man. gotta, do you mind coming over here? We gotta, can I borrow you for a minute? We yeah. gotta talk. This is awkward. But, you yeah. know, he, but yeah, he, he was extradited <laughs> back to Mississippi. He would avoid jail, but the stress and financial toll, you know, pretty much put a wedge in the friendship between him and Sullivan because him and Sullivan had a very complicated friendship. At first, they hated each other because Muldoon being very puritanical about his training and, you know, exercise and say your prayers and eat your vitamins and eat right and don't drink. And just, you know, he was, that's how he was. So he looked at, at Sullivan as like this fat womanizing slob who he didn't respect. And then they, you know, met again and got along well on a circus show. Apparently they got involved in a wacky little scenario where um, Muldoon, his younger brother and Sullivan ended up getting arrested for beating the shit out of a few guys in a bar. Um, <laughs> they, you know, Sullivan, I assume due to his fame, was able to escape uh, any, you know, his charges. Muldoon brothers ended up pleading guilty, but fortunately the theater uh, touring company was nice and paid the $10 fine to cover the, uh, the damages. Yeah. Wish it was that little these days. Yeah, what a story that would be. So, so <laughs> Sullivan and the Muldoon brothers walk into a bar, right? And then it's just, it's madness. And what a cheapskate, man, 10 bucks. Like, you're, <laughs> you're the champ, buddy. You're picking up the tab. You better, I'm your coat. You pay for, for us. Right? We, we, right? Come on, man. I mean, that was, that, was kind of a, that was kind of a heelish move. Yeah, and then, you know, and then after that, you know, the, uh, after the legal situation over the, over the uh, Mississippi fight, in public, uh, Sullivan, uh, you know, who had been gone back to his, like, drinking, overeating ways, Muldoon publicly insulted him over that. So Sullivan was upset and began to downplay Muldoon's part in his victory in training. <laughs> which totally walked back uh, the last year of praise he was heaping on Muldoon. Both men threatened to beat the hell out of each other if they ever saw each other, but they were wise enough to stay away from each other. Um, and at this point, Muldoon now was training other boxers. He was the, you know, the, the celebrity coach. Uh, he referred to himself as a professional trainer. Uh, he was interviewed um, as an expert on nutrition and exercise. He trained boxers like Denver Ed Smith, even helped Jack kill Rain out with his routine. Wow. And even briefly later on, um, him and uh, Sullivan worked together when Sullivan was trying for you know yet another comeback fight. Uh, it didn't go terribly well because he was training for a fight against Bob Fitzsimmons. Uh, Sullivan was 39, weighed over 270, and Sullivan actually called it quits out of uh, frustration with the training. You know, he battled alcoholism, found religion as all scoundrels do, became a preacher, and passed away in 1918 after a legendary life and career. Um, and having retired from wrestling, here's something you don't see anymore, and nor should you. He didn't drop the title and then a tournament was happened or the top contenders faced off. He just passed his title of world champion onto his protege, uh, Ernest Robler, who, uh, you know, was his, his, his prize pupil, prize trainee. Uh, not exactly what we would call a legitimate passing of the torch. Because it wasn't in the ring, he was just like, "Oh, I'm done. Uh, you, you, you're the you're the champion now. Yeah, here you take take the belt." He, of course, uh, poor Ernst Rubler, suddenly ha had the title he didn't earn, yeah. didn't deserve, couldn't defend, and was soon defeated by Evan Strangler Lewis. Yeah, here's the stake, kid. Go defeat the wolves. <laughs> like that, that is that is not only not how you drop the strap, but that is gonna just put you just put the number two headband on the crosshairs on your boy. That is a brutal, brutal way to get the title. Exactly. But it's, you know, and that's the thing you'll see in wrestling when things start becoming a little less on the up and up is the big fight over who to drop the title to. Uh, you know, you'll have, you know, the, the, you know, the promoters who never thought they could trust anybody outside their own family dropping it to their sons. Uh, it, it's just a wild and crazy uh, business. And we will, we will all explore over coming episodes. Muldoon, um, now mostly known as a uh, fitness expert, he was also a boxing expert. He was a 
uh, you know, trainer of the boxers. He was a boxing judge, which was a weird job considering in many states, New York, for example. Boxers, boxing matches couldn't have decisions. It was either a win, decisive win, or a draw. So yeah. he uh, definitely earned some easy money doing that. But with his training, uh, unlike a lot of the contemporaries and you know, still to this day, he never wrote a book about training because he was one of the first people to realize each person has their own needs psychologically and physically and nutritionally to succeed at their sport. So he really like fine-tuned everything to the specific person, which is something you didn't see back in those days. Yeah, I mean, he was a visionary in so many aspects of, of you know, from, from performing. I mean, the fact that this guy, you know, went to war at 12 years old with a drum in his hand to, to performing on Broadway stages with no theatrical experience relatively prior to that, probably for people to just getting thrown in the deep end and performing at the highest level to being a traveling, competing world champion for the better part of a decade while doing all these other magnificent showtimey things. He was a true Renaissance man. And, and I mean, I don't know if you know this. Well, you, I'm sure you do know this. I took one note. You know what my note says? My note says, and this is probably wrong, that he was the first ever commissioner. Yep, he was the New York uh, Athletic Commissioner. Did I, did I jump ahead? Or did no, I... no. I mean, it's we're kind of wrapping things up here after his Tight. retirement because, you know, like I said, he would, you know, he he ran, he was a boxing judge, he yeah. was a boxing uh, trainer. Most of the fighters he he trained went on to be very successful. So clearly he had the right, uh, the right idea. And he opened up the Olympia, which was his fitness farm up in New York, where not only professional athletes would come and train with him, Teddy Roosevelt, who was a massive admirer and fan of physical culture, yeah. who would take his uh, cabinet members who were being like, just were like being worked to death and send them up to be restored by, wow. uh, by Muldoon. Um, so he, you know, cause it's like, he was, he advertised his uh, plan to wealthy men because Wealthy men can drop X amount of money to go live on a farm and be worked out totally. for all gosh darn day. Um, and that, like I said, that so it was politicians, businessmen, men of means, people who are not used to getting bossed around yeah. came to his boot camp. Uh, and you'll have stories like uh, Joseph Choate, who was the U.S. ambassador to Britain, came to, uh, you know, do this, uh, you know, came to get his like health together. And he was like forcing him up at 7 a.m., forcing yeah. him to bed at 9 a.m., making him go up and down hills, doing all this stuff. And at the end of the road, he was in great shape, even though he was 74 years old and had been bullied for, uh, for fucking three weeks over this. So yeah, so he opened up the Olympia, his health farm. He had a great relationship with politicians like Teddy Roosevelt. He was a personal trainer to millionaire businessmen, ambassadors to other countries, professional boxers. He was like the celebrity trainer yeah, of the day. Celebrity trainer. He was like, you know, a Jack Vulane or something. Yeah. And like, once again, you'd bring you to compare him to Diamond Dallas Page, a pro wrestler totally. who created his own fitness plan, which restored the health of hundreds. And people would say it was completely crazy because, you know, he would um, do the exercises with people all the way through his seventies. So yeah. he would never expect people to do something he himself wasn't doing, no matter how old he was. He became the first athletic commissioner of New York of New York State, which is kind of funny considering how many weird worked matches he probably was involved in and some of the illegal stuff. But hey, you know what? No one's perfect. So it's just completely unbelievable that this man had the life he did, succeeded to the heights he succeeded in all of these different ventures. Yeah, I mean, he's the world's most interesting man. You're talking about a guy who carried a drum into the Civil War at 12 years old, said that's not enough war, joined the French Foreign Legion, learned Greco-Roman, became the Greco-Roman world champion for a better part of a decade while he performed on Broadway, while he became this crossover cultural icon as a trainer. He trained the best boxer in the world at the same time. I mean, it, the the magnitude of moves that this guy made, you know, several of the greatest people in our comparative generation, when we look at, you know, fighters from our era and compare them, or people that have done what he did, talking about DDP. I mean, this guy did, you know, what The Rock plus Jack Vallane plus, you know, I mean, 
Freddie Roach. This guy was incredible. And it's unbelievable that one person could fit this much greatness into their life. Absolutely. And even into his uh, old age, even in his 70s, he was still traveling, lecturing. Uh, he would lecture against the sedentary lifestyle that threatens men's health. In his view, people need to walk everywhere, play sports, except football, which he considered too dangerous and bad for the body. But, which wow. Is, that's pretty That's pretty telling as well, you know. Oh, absolutely. He would... Um, you know, he, he like it was very strange. He we would like specifically call out the German culture for their love of beer, carbs, and sausage at night, which <laughs> he thought nobody should be doing uh, for for health reasons, which is fairly true. Carb shaming us all. Yeah, for, just carb shaming the hell out of everybody. Yeah. Um, and you know, and he was also one of the first people to really push weight training and strength yeah. training, not just for physical uh, improvement, but for like mental discipline and improvement as a person. Uh, he trained men, often training with them at high levels until his death in 1933 at age 81, which I had to dig a little bit. Apparently, he died of cancer. And I guess this was the thing doctors would do back in that day. Just say, oh, you're dying. Oh, of what? Eh, not going to tell you. Like, they didn't tell him he had cancer because, what you know, what do you do with that, that information yeah. at uh, in 1933? Wow. So, but he was still suffering from cancer, training famous athletes yeah. up on his farm in New York before passing away at the age of 81. Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to say, man, it's like, if you took, it's really, it's really incredible if you take the entire life's accomplishments of The Rock. Think about what The Rock did. The Rock did his WWF run in what, three years, right? Something like that. Yeah, you know, the world championships, I mean, it wasn't, he wasn't on top nearly as long as this. This was a decade long run while simultaneously being a crossover uh, entertainment icon. It was, it was really an incredible run. And to cross over again and reinvent and reinvent with the foresight of where he was going in his career, he really was a, a true renaissance man. Oh, absolutely. He was an athlete. He was a champion. He was a soldier. He was a Broadway star. He was a bit of a showman. He was a bit of a carny. He was yeah. a salesman. He was everything and everywhere. And a lot of what professional wrestling is and became and was in that day he laid the groundwork for. He is a legend for very, very, very many reasons. And a lot of people don't know who he is. Uh, a lot of people who, you know, when I told them we're starting this podcast, had no idea about this stuff. When I told them we're going to be exploring pro wrestling history, they were like, oh, the Gold Dust Trio. I'm like, no, man, we're going back to the 1880s. Yeah. We're starting at the root of things. And I think this is why it's so fun and so exciting because you see these crazy lives that these people had back in these days. And you see how the sport and the athletes progress over a bit over a century. And we're going to be uh, calling it quits right here for now. Uh, but hey, guess what? We're going to be back with another episode very, very soon. We're going to, you know, we're going to kind of keep a little, you know, little con continuity going here when we explore the life, the times, and the brutal submission uh, skills of Evan Strangler Lewis. The man who showed that one hold can dominate and terrorize an entire an entire world. He, he was a, he was one of the most terrifying men, and maybe the first one of the first villains, true villains in professional wrestling history. Oh, absolutely! He was a bad man. He was hated by everyone, and we cannot wait to talk about him. So until then, I'm Nick. That's Chongo. Goodbye, everybody. Ta-da!